Revelation chapter 3, and we are in the last of the seven letters. There were seven um, candlesticks that in chapter 1, John seen this vision of Jesus or this representation of Jesus, the Son of Man clothed in this garment and eyes like a flame of fire and hair you know, white like wool and glorious. And he's standing among seven candlesticks with seven stars in his hand. And the interpretation was given to us that the seven candlesticks were the seven churches and their name. They're, they're not all the churches of Asia Minor, but they were ones that were chosen by Jesus for his own purpose. And uh, probably because each one of the messages that he gives to them is something that would apply to every church in every age and, and really to all of us individually as well as warnings in some cases, encouragements in others. Each one of the letters ends, he who has ears uh, or he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So it's a message to each one of us individually, to us as a church. And so this last one is sort of in some way we'd say maybe the heaviest. There's even the dead church that we studied but this church at Laodicea somehow to me seems worse, and I'll, I'll tell you why as we go through this. Um, verse 14, to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, or the, the prince or the, the, the main, you know, the, the main part of the creation of God. So his, his, this message is coming from the person who's faithful and true witness. So when he speaks about you, it's faithful and it's true. And he's about to say some pretty heavy things to this church. In fact, this is one of the churches that Jesus doesn't have anything good to say to, um, but just a challenge. So he's the amen. When he says it, all you can say is amen. <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes someone will say something and you, you don't really want to say Amen. Because you don't really agree. Amen is a, is a way of saying, I agree. You know, so be it. I, I, I concur. So when we're praying with each other, you, that's why you say amen. You hear someone pray, and you think, man, that's right. That's exactly what I was thinking. And other times someone's praying, and you might be thinking, no, please don't answer that one, Lord. Don't answer. Um, Jesus is the amen because he's the beginning of the creation of God. He's the faithful witness. If he says it, then you say Amen. Um, if he's, he's, you can count on what he says. He's faithful. You, what he says is true. And he's the, he's the focus of all the creation. So then his assessment of the church, verse 15, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. And so then, because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, I have to admit, when I first was reading through the Bible as a high school student, um, I really thought that was a cool verse, uh, mainly just because it said vomit in the Bible. I thought that was cool. And uh, I remember one of my friends, Dave, uh, back in the day when we first were saved, he, he was just so zealous for the Lord. And, and, and anybody he thought was lukewarm, he'd go, he'd go, you know, if you're lukewarm, you're barf to God. And he just... I don't really know that's how Jesus wants us to go around and encourage people from this verse, but I, I could, I, every time I read this, I can hear his voice saying, if you're lukewarm, you're barf to God, God, you know. And he'd talk about barf and how. So um, it's a heavy, it's graphic. Jesus says, I know what you're doing. I totally see it. I totally get it. And this is my assessment, that you're, you're not, hot you're not cold you're just lukewarm and because that's the state that you're in I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth what a graphic picture now you can raise your hand if you want on this one has anybody ever vomited in here you have haven't you everybody's vomited did you like it no vomiting is not something that we like why does why does that happen what's happening in us physically that would make us vomit. If you think about it in the analogy and why Jesus would use these words, it's very interesting. Um, it, in order to vomit something, it means what? It means you have had to have eaten it. You've, you've taken the thing in. So th these are people that have been taken in, but now they're going back out. And so uh, if, if I ate something... And, and it goes in, and then my body immediately, that I, the thing that I've taken in, my body immediately begins to work on it to try to make it part of me. 
if I uh, ate an In-N-Out burger today. I didn't, but let's just say I did. And it was now sitting in there. My body would be introducing itself. It would say, hello, Mr. Double Double. Uh, you've, you've enjoyed autonomy for a short period of time. You know, they just whipped you together right when Rich ordered you. And uh, you managed to have your own personal identity for a short period of time. But we're here to make you part of Rich Chafin. And then my body would begin to go to work on that. And if the In-N-Out burger said, no, I'm going to stay a double-double. I like who I am. And I, I've, it, you, know, it was a, you know, I was separated, but I finally all came together. And no, I'm not going to become part of Rich Chafin. Well, there would be a battle in my stomach. And then I would be trying to teach, and I'd be thinking, man, something, oh, I don't know what's going on. Something's not right. And if that battle kept going, and if the In-N-Out burger never said I'm going to become part of Rich Chafin, what will happen? It'll come out. It'll, come, it'll, it'll go right back out the way it came in. Something, something's not right in the digestive system. So it's interesting that Jesus would choose this expression. It's not hot and it's not cold. It's lukewarm. It's interesting that he would say it to this church because all, all the things that he uses as analogies to speak to the different churches, you can look at what was going on in that city and you'll see that there, he's using analogies or, or things that are familiar. These guys would ha- have this water aqueduct from one of the other cities from a hot spring that would, that would bring the water down to their city, and it came out hot, and by the time it got to the city, it was lukewarm. And it was understood that you wanted, you wanted something that was hot to drink, or you wanted something cold that was drink, but you didn't want something that was lukewarm. It wasn't desirous. It was, you, you wouldn't, that's not how you wanted it, and yet that's how it came. And so he's not saying something completely foreign. When he says lukewarm, they know exactly, like they've got a picture from their own city, from their own life, and then Jesus said, listen, because you're lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. So what does that mean? It's like, well, you were in, but you, something's not right. So you're going out. That's what happens when we're vomiting. You know, something went in, and something's not right. And so out it goes. And, and, and one of the things, you know, it's sort of an involuntary thing. You ever see with your little kids, and they go, I think I'm going to be sick. And what do you do immediately as with a child? You know, like, they've got no control over that. You every, Slow motion, no. As you start to make your move, you know, and you get pasted. They, they can't, it's just the, the, your stomach muscles, it hurts. Your body just says, no, it, this food is not cooperating. Something's not right, and... You know, you, you're hurt all over. It's, it can be painful. One of, the, you know, one of the hardest things to go through is a bad case of food poisoning. See someone wiped out afterward physically, like just wiped out. So here's Jesus kind of using this analogy, graphic and gross and, and really heavy. You imagine Jesus, you know, you, you, you read the book of Revelation. Hey, John's, John saw a vision and our church is mentioned. Oh, really? Oh, what, what does it say? Well, we're last. Oh, we saved the best for last. And you get up to read. Imagine sitting in Laodicea the first time they read this. Right? This, this is a real church. These are real people. This was a real letter. The guy comes up. Hey, I got a scroll. John sent it out. We got it. I came from Patmos. You know, we've been making copies and sent them out. And I brought one to you guys. Well, get the church together. Get everybody gathered together. And then they open up and, you know, here, here, to the change of the church. Oh, he's a faithful witness. Oh, we know he is. I know your works. Yes, you do. You're not hot or cold. What? You're just lukewarm. Oh, oh. and I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Whoa. It's pretty heavy. That being said, I don't think that that is, to me, the most um, fearful or the most awesome part of the message the awe-inspiring part is the next sentence look at verse 17 because you say i'm rich have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you're wretched miserable poor blind and naked they're lukewarm and they don't know they're lukewarm see to me it's not it's it's 
obviously it's bad that they're lukewarm, but to me the most frightening part of this message is not that they're lukewarm. It's that if you went to them and said, are you lukewarm? Their answer would be, we're not lukewarm. We're rich. Well, you know, I was here visiting, and I'm not sure about what's going on here. No, 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 we don't need anything. We're, everything's fine. We got it dialed in. We're doing stuff. They don't know they're lukewarm. To me, that's the frightening part. To be in a place where Jesus is making this assessment, but then he says, you say this. Now, he said what he said, but this is what they say. They're completely ignorant of their true condition. They say, I'm rich, I'm wealthy, I have need of nothing. Save your place here, and let's look at a warning to Israel back in the book of Deuteronomy. So turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy is easy to find because if you go to the cover, the front cover, and then just go forward about five books, or exactly five books. Deuteronomy chapter 8, starting in verse 11. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes, which I command you this day. This is Moses speaking to the children of Israel. They've come out of Egypt. They've wandered around the wilderness. They're about to go into the promised land. So Moses has been ministering to them for almost 40 years. So this is sort of a reiteration of the law. And it comes with this warning. Careful to obey. Careful to keep these statutes that I command you. Verse 12. Here's the warning. Lest... When you have eaten and are full, and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply, and your silver and your gold are multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, and when your heart is lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage, who led you through the great and terrible wilderness, in which there were fiery serpents and scorpions, a thirsty land where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you, that he might test you to do you good in the end, that then you'd say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Then it shall be, if you by any means forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day that you will surely perish as the nations which the Lord destroys before you, so you shall perish because you would not be obedient to the voice of the Lord your God. It's a pretty heavy warning especially in light of the fact that we know Israel's history. So here's, here's Moses telling him, listen, you're about to be super blessed by God. God's doing this amazing work. You're going to end up in the land flowing with milk and honey. You're going to have houses. You're going to be successful. You're going to have all these things. You need to be really careful because when your money is multiplied and all your flocks are multiplied and everything you have is multiplied, that you'll forget God. How could they forget God? How could you forget God? Well, it's easy. It happens. That's why he's making the warning. And he says, you'll forget God, and then you'll start serving. I mean, you'll take credit for what's happening, and then you'll start serving idols. And then you're going to drift away from God, and you won't even come back when God calls you back. And then you'll be destroyed like the nations that are going to be destroyed when you go into the land. You see, the church of Laodicea is getting a similar kind of, uh, they're at the other end of it, it's the same exact sort of problem. These guys got, it's a church. <laughs> they have works. He says, I know your works. They, they've accepted Jesus. Something's happened. But, and they're at a point where like, hey, everything's great. We're rich. We have everything we need. We don't need anything. And, and yet Jesus says about them, look at the list. Look back in Revelation chapter 3. Verse 17, their list, I'm rich, I'm wealthy, I don't need anything. Look what Jesus' list is. You're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. The word wretched means wretched. 
The word miserable, it means miserable. The word poor means poor. The word blind means blind. And the word naked means naked. There's no tricky things here in the original language. You're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I have a question. Every time I've ever read this, I always have the same question. How can you be naked and not know that you're naked? That would be really a bummer. Don't you think? I'm glad I don't have that problem. You know, I'm a public speaker. I'm talking in front of people. One of the things you don't ever want to have happen is have like your zipper down when you're teaching or something's wrong. You know, something's not right the way that you're appearing. You don't want to be distracting away from the message you're trying to bring. If you had the problem of being naked but not knowing that you were naked, that would be bad. Of all the problems that you could have in your life, that would be one of the bad ones. So if Jesus said, you're naked. Uh, Oh, I'm not naked. No, you are. To be naked and not know that you're naked? Now, what about being poor? If you're poor, don't you know that you're poor? No, I'm rich. No, you're poor. No, 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 you don't. Look at me, I'm rich. And Jesus said, you don't even know that you're poor. Don't you think that if you were blind, you would know that you were blind? Right? I'm blind. I, I got to wear these glasses. Because if I take them off, you guys disappear. You become a beautiful, impressionistic painting of the inside of our sanctuary. <laughs> sort of a rep, an artist's representation of what it must be like, you know, as, the, as all the colors merge into one body of Christ. We truly are one when I take my glasses off. <laughs> I mean, you guys are like... You don't, you, oh, there you are. It's good to see you again. Look, at if you're blind, you know you're blind. If you can't see anything, don't you know that you can't see? To be blind and not know you're blind, to be naked and not know you're naked. Don't you think that if you're miserable, you know you're miserable? Jesus says you're miserable, and they say, no, we're not. We're content. Wouldn't that be a bummer? To be content with being miserable? To be wretched and to say, I'm not wretched. I like it like this. No, 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 no. This is, re- this is a wretched state. No, it isn't. I love this state. This is where I'm happiest. And Jesus said, you're poor. I'm not poor. I'm rich. How can they not know? I mean, if you look at it, you think, well, how are they stupid? Like, what is it? Is it? What, how can they not know? Well, th- this is why. This is how. That's why I wanted to look at the Deuteronomy passage. The warning in Deuteronomy was, you're going to have everything multiplied to you, and you're going to be rich, and you're going to forget God. They don't know that they're poor because they have riches. They have nice houses. The city of Laodicea, we know, is very prosperous, they were successful. They, there were some industries where they really were thriving. The people had a, a high standard of living. They weren't poor. They also didn't know they were blind because they could see. They thought they could see. And they didn't know they were naked because they were clothed. At least they thought they were clothed. But here's the deal. They didn't have true riches, and they didn't have true vision, and they didn't have true clothing. They, they had accepted a substitute. They had bought into a lie. You see, Jesus will provide clothing for you, and he'll provide true riches for you, and he'll give you real vision. But there's a danger, and these guys had fallen for it they'd fallen into it where they they'd given up the true for a cheap counterfeit the counterfeit is so cheap that in fact you're not clothed you're naked it's so cheap in fact it not only is, is it not vision but you're actually blind it's so cheap that not only are you not rich you're actually wretched you're miserable you're poor you have u- u- utter poverty You see, the danger here is that they've accepted a substitute and they're totally ignorant of it. That's why, to me, this is the most frightening of all. Because if you came to talk to them, they would say everything's fine, everything's great. Now, additionally, 
not only had they accepted the substitute, but they think that the substitute, or they would call the substitute the real thing. I'm rich. So they, that not only have they bought into it, but actually their profession is, this is the real thing. These are real riches. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. You remember this verse? My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. A backsliding nation, Israel. Jeremiah, their prophet, as they're about to go to destruction. What, what uh, Moses warned about in Deuteronomy 8 is happening in Jeremiah's lifetime. Everything that Moses warned about, it's now come all the way to the end, and they're going to perish as a nation. They're going to be destroyed, taken away into captivity. God, it's God's discipline. They'll be able to come back. But it's, it's going to be conquered, conquering, completely conquered. Temple destroyed. Uh, the end of the nation for 70 years, they'll be in a captivity. And God, speaking through Jeremiah, my people have committed two evils. You want to boil it all down to this, two things. They left me. And isn't that what God said through Moses, or Moses warned about? You're going to forget God. You've left me, the fountain of living waters. And what happens when you leave God? You ex you're going to accept some kind of substitute. You've left me, the fountain of living waters. Jeremiah says, to hew for yourself broken cisterns that can hold no water. You left the living fountain of the living water, a continual supply, and in, and in its place, you chose a reservoir of stone that won't even hold water. And that's what's happened in the church at Laodicea. They're, they started, somehow there was some kind of start. It must have been good. There's a church there. People had followed the Lord. But what's happened is they forgot God, and they've, they've substituted something else. They've got a cheap substitute. They no longer have vision. They no longer have riches. They, they no longer have clothing. And, and yet the substitute that they've chosen has left them naked and poor and wretched, miserable, blind. Now, I want you to, um, if that's the condition, I want you to notice Jesus' counsel or the prescription to get out of this situation. I think this is very important. What is needed for this lukewarm church? Verse 18, he says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich, white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It's great hope for this church. Jesus gives them the antidote. He gives them medicine that will cure their disease. The problems that they're having, the substitutes that they've accepted, they've lost the real thing, and now they've got this cheap substitute so Jesus says in verse 18, I'll give you the real thing. You don't have true riches. I counsel you that I'll give you real gold, refined gold. I'll give you something that's really valuable. I'll clothe you. I'll give you white garments so that you're not ashamed of your nakedness. And anoint your eyes with eye salve. I'll give you vision. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. I love you is Jesus' message to them. So my friend Dave, in his zeal as a young high school student, saying, if you're lukewarm, you're barf to God. Well, Jesus used the strong analogy, but that strong analogy was a wake-up call. It was that really annoying alarm clock that you, it goes off and it's, rah, rah, it's just the worst sound. Listen, you're lukewarm, and he says such strong language, but the reason is, is I love you. I love you, and you're, you've, you've replaced me with something else. I want to give you riches, but you don't think that my riches are riches. You think these are riches. You've forgotten me. You're clothing yourself with something that will not clothe you. You have no vision. You have no riches. Let me give you riches. Let me give you clothing. Let me give you vision. Because I love you. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. One of the most difficult parts of being a parent is disciplining your children. I think that 
Um, the Bible makes it really clear that the mark of relationship, you know, between a parent and a child is discipline. In the Hebrews, in fact, it says if you're not being disciplined, then it's a sign that you're illegitimate. You're not legitimate. The discipline of God in your life shows that you're legitimate, that you're his. Listen, we've all seen kids that needed to be disciplined, but when they weren't ours, we didn't discipline them. Why? Because you don't want to go to jail. <laughs> it's not your kid. You don't get to go into the store and go, look at, don't worry, lady, you keep shopping. I'll shape up your kid. Don't do that. <laughs> Why? Well, it's not your child. You don't get to put someone else's kid in a timeout. You don't get to go. They're not yours. It's that relationship that that it, that would allow discipline is that really no no the parents should discipline the child because who else loves the child like the parent does and I don't really you know I didn't want anybody else disciplining my kids because you don't love my kids like I love my kids and and for to discipline properly you have to right, have the right amount of love you have to have that crazy parent love so God says I love you those that I love I, I rebuke I chasten this rebuke is not because I don't love you. It's because I do love you, but you're naked and you're miserable and you're wretched and you're poor and you can't see. I love you. I don't want you like that. And in that state, if I even asked you how you were doing, you'd say, I'm rich and you're poor. And I'd say, do you have any vision? You'd say, I can see. I know what's coming. And I'd say, you have no idea what's coming. You can't see anything. You're poor and blind and naked. And I can't leave you in that state, and I love you, and I want to set you free. So what does he say? Verse 19, he says, be zealous and repent. Be zealous and repent. Zeal is a very important quality. It's a, it's a great word. It has to do with fire and passion. Be zealous you should get fired up, is what Jesus is saying. When I say these things to you, I'm not expecting you to be able to listen to this and stay in your chair and go, well, that's an interesting thing. I'll be thinking about that. When I'm done saying what I'm saying to you, Jesus is saying, I want you to jump out of your chair like, like you got set on fire. Like if you don't do something right now, you're going to die. I want you to, I want you to react to this thing. I'm telling you something, and you can't just go ho-hum. I'm telling you, be zealous. And that zeal is not just an uncontrolled zeal. This isn't going to be the chop the head off the chicken and let it just be zealous, running around with no head until it finally falls over dead. Be zealous and repent. The zeal that I'm calling for you to have is going to be expressed in you agreeing with me. Be zealous and have a, that change of mind. You've said you're rich. I said you're poor. You need to change your mind. You said that you're clothed. I said you're naked. You need to change your mind. You need to be serious about it. You said that you don't need anything. And I said you don't have anything. <laughs> you need to be zealous and you need to change your mind. He's calling for them to have this uh, response that's dramatic. Zeal. Be zealous and repent. I think that uh, it's very important that when God's speaking to us about what he's trying to do in our lives, that we take it seriously. Um, I think that sometimes because God is so patient and he's so merciful and he exercises so much long suffering that we can become lackadaisical when he starts to put his finger on something in our life, especially people that have known the Lord for a while. I'm talking about a brand new Christian, but maybe you've been saved three years or five years or eight years or ten years or longer where you've learned like well wow the Lord he's he's really patient he's way more patient than I thought and then now he speaks to you about something and his res the response that he gets is a ho-hum well I'll start I'll start on that tomorrow I'll procrastinate listen if right now I realized that I was actually naked I would fix it okay I'm just going to use the analogy that Jesus had if right now I realize that I had this disease of being naked but not knowing that you're naked and all of a sudden I got cured of it and I look, I was, oh, I'm naked. I will fix it, you guys. I'm not exactly sure how, but I would. I'd get my pulpit close and I'd back out of here. 
I wouldn't sit here and go, well, you know, maybe by Sunday I'll, I'll figure out a solution to this. Let's go to my next point. If you're naked and you realize that you're naked and that's completely inappropriate, you're going to fix that in a heartbeat. You're not going to wait around. You're not going to just go, yeah, I could be naked for a while. Yeah, I kind of like being naked. Come on. Who would do such a thing? It's, it's, it's crazy. If, if you're destitute and utterly poor and here's a solution to get out of your poverty, wouldn't you be all over it? I mean, if someone came to, up to somebody who was, who was destitute, and said, look at here's this lottery ticket. I just scratched the numbers off, and it's a mega millions winner. And, and the jackpot's 33 million. And I don't know, I was walking by, and God told me to give it to you. He told me, I'm not supposed to have the money. He told me to give it to you. Here it is. You think the person's going to go, well, I'll cash it in later. I, you know, I kind of like being destitute. It's all, I mean, you know, it's pretty cool. I'm free. I get to do whatever I want. I'm going to have to pay taxes now. No one even knows. I mean, I don't even have a social security number. You know, they never tracked me down. Who would do that? I mean, you wouldn't do that. Someone gave you that kind of wealth and you had destitution and someone gave you wealth. What would happen? You'd be zealous and you'd change your mind. You'd say, you know what? I guess I got some riches. I just got some clothes. If you lacked vision. And listen, I think this is a very important one. If you lacked vision. We can't underestimate the value of what it means to have fellowship with Jesus and the vision that we have, the vision that we get. God speaks to us about our lives. He'll tell us about stuff way before it happens, and he'll start preparing us, and we don't even know exactly how the thing's going to turn out, but he's already speaking to us, and, and then the thing starts to unfold, and you see it unfold, and you think, man, I didn't know it was this, but I knew this thing was coming. God had been speaking. God's been preparing me. If I look over the last six months of all the what God's been saying to me in the word, you can pull out your, your journal if you keep track of how God's been speaking to you and your prayers. You can pull that thing out and look back over the last several, and you go, look at that. God already, God told me all this stuff. You can't underestimate the value of that relationship with Jesus and the vision that God gives. But to not have that, and to think that your horoscope means something, or to go to the person you think is successful, the guru who's got the new business plan, or the church growth guy whose church went, went for it and blew up, and now I'm gonna, we'll just do what that guy did. And to not have vision, and to have somebody come along and say, here, let me fix your eyes so you can really see. Wouldn't you just jump on it? You'd be zealous to be blind and now to be able to see, to be broke, poor, destitute, and now have riches, be zealous and repent. I love you. What a message. I love you guys, and you need to change, Jesus says. So be zealous and repent. There are some command words here. If you look at the original language, the words that are used as John writes this in Greek, the imperatives are be zealous and repent <laughs> and anoint. Anoint your eyes. That's one of the commands. Anoint your eyes. Jesus says in verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Here's the next thing. Be zealous, repent, and then this. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. What is he asking for? I want you to be zealous. I want you to repent, and I want you to open up to me. Doesn't that sound hard and very religious? This just sounds like Jesus says he's a killjoy. What did he tell you to do? He told you to get excited about getting rich, having true riches. He told you to get excited about not being naked anymore and having real clothing. He just told you he's going to give you vision. You can anoint your eyes with what he'll give you, and you'll now be able to see. He told you to be excited about that, change your mind, agree with him, and then open up to him, and he'll come in and eat with you. Remember... I'm going to spew you out of my mouth is the analogy we started with. That's the metaphor. You've gone in, but you're going to go shooting out. Now he's coming in. <laughs> he's mixing his metaphors. Open the, I'll, if you open the door, I'll come in. Opening, opening the door to Jesus. That's, that's the antidote for the lukewarm state. Open the door to Jesus. Can you hear him knocking? Is he knocking at your life and saying, can you just... Can you just let me give you vision and stop trying to figure all this stuff out? Would you just surrender? 
you think that's so valuable and you're putting so much energy into that and you're so stressed out, why don't you let me give you true riches? The world says that stuff is valuable and it's just weighing you down. Let me give you true riches that are eternal, that will last forever. Receive the true riches from him. When he says, I'll give you gold that's refined in the fire, we have a wonderful privilege because of Jesus to live for the kingdom of God. In the world, uh, Bill Gates tried to build a kingdom. Steve Jobs trying to build a kingdom. President Obama building a kingdom. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why our forefathers uh, had terms, you know, of how long someone could stay to face an election again. And thank God George Washington set the pace and said, look at two terms as president is enough. And set an example. Why, why is that? Because you guys are going to build a kingdom. They're going to get all their friends and all the positions. They're going to start building a kingdom. There's all kinds of kingdoms in this world that you can try to be part of. Jesus lets you be part of the kingdom, the only one that matters. The one that's forever. We get to live for the kingdom of God. Our lives that someone might look at us and go, your life is pretty mundane. And you can say, oh, don't underestimate me. I belong to Jesus and I'm living for his kingdom. So all this, thing, all this stuff that you think is mundane, every day he's telling me what to do. And every day I'm faithfully doing what he told me to do. And I'm part of the kingdom of God. I'm living for the kingdom of God. And, and as such, then, I, I'm going to receive the benefit of living for the kingdom of God. Living for the glory of God. Most of the kingdoms that we're talking about, the kingdoms of men, they're about the glory of man. This person has done what no one else has done. This person has accumulated what no one else could accumulate. This person has opened doors that no one else could open. And their glory, listen, that glory is fading. We get to live for the glory of God. You get to bring him glory. Pray for somebody. Share the truth with somebody. Watch God work in someone's life. And they say, that was so great. I'm going to have you pray for me every time. And you can say, oh, you don't need me to pray for you. That was Jesus who did that. The Lord, he's the one. He died on the cross for your sins. It's him. We live for the glory of God. True riches. Putting on white garments. Open the door to Jesus and let him give you the garments that you're not naked. Fine, he says, white garments. You'll be clothed and the shame of your nakedness won't be revealed. When we open the door to Jesus, it means we're living in the grace of God. We're living in the finished work of Jesus. We've experienced his love and his forgiveness and his acceptance. Why would I be clothed with something else? What are you wearing? This is the vest of rich. I'm going to put it on. It's, it's, it's kind of my goodness. I'm going to wear it. Like, well, all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. I think you might want to take that one off. Here, Jesus would say, put on this. What is it? It's a robe of righteousness. It's my righteousness. The grace of God. Opening your heart to Jesus when he stands at the door and knock, letting him come in, that's grace. It's grace. Receiving what you don't deserve. And then I think this idea, and I think, you know, in verse 18, the command to anoint your eyes. Anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Get some vision. When you open your heart to Jesus and he comes in, he gives you vision. He'll he'll show you things. He'll give you direction. And everybody else watching, they wouldn't be able to give you that direction because they can't see what he sees. And he'll tell you things. And you'll tell people. You'll say, I think the Lord's telling me this. And they'll say, you're crazy. He's not telling you that. I was just recently with a friend who was uh, he's making a big life decision. He was talking with his dad. And his dad is just giving him all this grief. Why? His dad can't see. My friend has, is, says he's, he's surrendered. You know, Jesus is in, and Jesus is showing him stuff, and he's saying yes to it. And the Lord's doing all this crazy open doors and confirmation of all of it, and his dad is telling him, no. And why is that? He can't see. He can't see what, well, my friend can see what, he can see because Jesus is showing him. Boy, if you, when Jesus says, anoint your eyes, I'll give you something you can anoint your eyes with. Your vision's just all messed up. I'll give you some drops, <laughs> and it'll clear it all up. Didn't, isn't there a promise in Joel 
In the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. What's going to happen? A mark of the new covenant, a mark of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit in our lives is that we're going to see things that no one else is. We're going to have supernatural vision. You're going to see things that will come to you in a picture or in a dream or in a vision, and it'll be information straight from God about what he's about to do, and no one would ever be able to deduce it. Normally, what we know about the future is by deduction. We look at this, we look at that, we put the factors together, we make calculations, we sort of extrapolate out a future, and we try to make a plan that's going to reach out to that. God knows the future, the beginning from the end, and so he speaks to his people who've opened the door and let him come in, and he says, here, this is what I need you to do. But Lord, I don't understand. Just do it. Fill the water pots with water. But Lord, we need wine. There's a wedding's about to go under, man. This is going to be bad. Fill the water pots with water. We don't need water, Jesus. We need wine. It's not helpful. Just fill him with water. Why? Because he knows that he's going to do a miracle. I'll just tell you what to do, and you just do what I say, and you'll be in the right place at the right time doing the right thing, and then I'll blow your mind with who I am. Now, that's awesome. Why would you want anything less than that? I mean, here's a lukewarm church going, we can see fine. I, oh, no, you can't. You're blind. Jesus is going to show you, and you don't even know. Opening the door to Jesus, receive the true riches from him, put on the white garments and get some vision. You see the things from the Spirit. And all of this is about this promise of coming in. Look at verse 20 again. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. There's something about Jesus and eating with people. And here it is again. Just let me come in and we'll have a bite. We'll have a bite to eat. <laughs> I'll come in and we'll sit down at the table and we'll eat together. Now, this is really important because culturally, to eat with somebody was very intimate. We're, you know, I'm from California. I'm from Southern California where we do lunch. You know, eating with someone doesn't mean anything to a Southern Californian. It no, doesn't mean anything. There's no commitment there. It's like, hey, I, I went out to lunch with that guy. I thought you didn't like him. I don't. I went out to lunch with him. You know, he's, he's, he's a bozo. In that culture, if you sat down and ate with someone... It was a sort of, it was community bowls, you know. Get the food, it's set in front of you. You're all digging in the same bowls, d double dipping. I mean, you're literally becoming one. But they saw it as a very intimate experience. If you would eat with somebody, you were saying, I've, I've embraced you in a very intimate way, and, and we're one. It's very, very, very important to share a meal with somebody. And so when Jesus said, look at just let me in. I'll, I'll come in. The, it's, it's really, it's, it's fellowship. It's a relationship. It's a promise of fellowship. Here's a church that has forsaken him, the fountain of living waters, and they've hewn out broken cisterns that can hold no water. And because he loves them, he says, let me back in. Let me in, and I'll give you back what you lost. You need to be zealous, though, and repent. Take this seriously. Turn around, agree with me, and I'll give you real riches. I'll give you real clothing. I'll give you vision, and I'll come inside, and you'll have me. We'll be in a relationship again. You won't be with a broken cistern with no water. You'll, you'll have the fountain of living water again. And the promise in verse 21, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. I've always wondered about this verse spatially. You're going to sit with me on my throne. On your lap? Well, where's Gina going to sit? Well, she'll sit um, with me on my throne. Well, well, all the people from Calvary Chapel, Laguna Creek, will all be on you on your throne? Yep. What about, you mean all the people from all the churches in Sacramento will all be sitting with you? Yep. All the people who ever lived, who believed in Jesus and trusted in you? Yep. Spatially, I have a, I don't understand, totally get it, you know. Is he, God has a big lap? We're all, we're all there? I, don't, I mean, I don't know, it's a fig, it's a, it's an expression. But what's the expression? To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. 
Who sits with the king on his throne? The answer to that is no one. No one. Probably most kings would never even have their sons sit on their throne. Remember Herod, he would murder his sons. He was so, hey, this guy might get my throne and kill him. Here's God's, here's Jesus who's going to sit on the throne. I, if you overcome, look, I'm standing at the door. Let me come in. I will dine with you. And you overcome, you'll sit with me on my throne. What an amazing statement. Even as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So it's a crowded throne. Whose throne is it? It's God's. Who's on it? Well, the Father, Jesus sitting with the Father on his throne. Where are you headed? To the throne. <laughs> Where are you going to sit? With Jesus on his throne with his Father. How big is the throne? How, how, do, you, you know, how do you spatially? I have no idea. Don't try to paint this one. I don't know that you can paint a picture. I don't know that we can conceive of what he's saying. But the spirit of it, what is he saying? He's talking about intimacy. He's talking about sharing in, in who he is, in the expression of who he is. Here's a church that has forgotten who God is, and they've accepted a cheap substitute that's nothing. And here's Jesus saying, I love you. Let me give you back what you gave away. And I'm here at the door, and I'm knocking. Will you just let me come in? Who's like Jesus that ever lived? There's nobody like him. Who would say something like this? To speak so strongly about their real condition, tell the truth and love, and then offer such amazing, amazing grace uh, to a group that had, 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 had drifted so far to be naked and not know they were naked or poor and not know they're poor. The promise of fellowship. So, Father, we thank you for uh, the word of Jesus here. We thank you, God, for your Holy Spirit who, who speaks to us and applies your word to us. And he's called the spirit of truth, Lord. We thank you for the spirit of truth. And we ask you, Jesus, to speak to us. We want to receive from you the correction, Lord. Um, if there needs to be correction, the exhortation. I think of that phrase where you told them, be zealous and repent. What a good word. We want to receive it, Lord, whatever it is that you have. You're the faithful witness faithful and true witness, the amen. We want to be able to say amen to you, Lord. We ask that you'd speak to us. And thank you, God, for the great promise of true riches and clothing so that the shame of our nakedness would never be seen and that we can anoint our eyes, that you have something for us, Lord, to give us vision and that we can open the door that you'll come in and that one day we'll sit with you on your throne. What what an amazing, amazing God you are. What an am amazing work you've done. And so we want it all, Lord. And I, I just want to pray for those that are listening that maybe need true riches. Maybe you've been speaking to somebody that in fact they aren't rich, but they're poor. Lord, don't leave them in that state. But open their eyes, Lord, to the riches that you want to give them. True riches. You said if we try to save our life, we'll lose it. But if we lose our life, we'll find it. Show them the true riches of, of sacrifice, the true riches of denying ourselves and taking up our cross and following you. Lord, maybe you've been speaking to somebody about their lack of vision, that the lack of vision is coming from a lack of surrender or, or a, a substitution. They've, they've drifted. Lord, that, that they wouldn't just feel guilty about not seeing, but Lord, that you'd let them see. Pray that even right now, Lord, you give vision as they surrender. Thank you, Lord, that in, a, in just in any second we can just say, I surrender. Oh, Lord, I can't see. And that in that moment we can see that you meet with us, Lord. And maybe some that need to put on the, the robes of righteousness and they're naked. But they don't even they don't even know it, trying to clothe themselves in their own their own goodness. Lord, thank you that you don't speak to embarrass us, but you speak to deliver. And even right now, Lord, that they would receive by your spirit, that you'd touch, that you'd set free from that nakedness, Lord, that they'd put on the clothing that only you can provide, the white garments. We thank you, Lord. Thank you that you stand at the door and knock.
and we open our hearts to you. We thank you, Father, in, in Jesus' name. Amen.